Welcome. Thank you to everyone joining us online and here at the ASU California Center Broadway at the historic Herald Examiner Building in downtown Los Angeles. With great Welcome. respect, Zocalo Public Thank Square acknowledges the Yuhaviatum, the first people of this ancestral and unceded territory of Yangna that we now know as downtown Los Angeles. We honor their elders, past and present, and the Yuhaviatum descendants who are part of the Gabrielino Tongva and the Fernandeño Tataviam nations. We recognize that the Tongva are still here, and we are committed to lifting up their stories, culture, and community. As Kuyam, we recognize our responsibility and obligation to care for their land. I'm Bianca Collins. I'm the Director of Public Programs for Zocalo Public Square in Arizona State University Media Enterprise. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to each other. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and present conversations like this one. You can find us at ZocaloPublicSquare.org, on podcast platforms, and YouTube, so please subscribe for our latest programs. We were founded in 2003, and we are now celebrating our 20th birthday year. Tonight, we present the fourth program in our series, What is a Good Job Now? supported by the James Irvine Foundation, focusing on workers in the low-wage sectors of California's economy in communities across the state. Through public programs and essays grounded in workers' experiences and realities, we explore how to make the hardest jobs more rewarding and make life better for those who do them. This evening, we continue our series with what is a good job now for the formerly incarcerated? It's an honor to introduce our panel this evening and our moderator, Gilbert Johnson. Gilbert is a native of South Central LA and director of strategic reentry initiatives with the office of Mayor Karen Bass. He was introduced to civic engagement work in 2009, which marked the last year he was incarcerated. Finding it hard to gain sustainable employment, having to navigate homelessness, and working several jobs due to his criminal record, Gilbert's prayers were answered when he received the opportunity to be an outreach worker at Community Coalition, or as we call it, COCO. He eventually became the lead justice organizer leading COCO's criminal justice reform and reentry work. He left COCO to become the California State Time Done Manager with Californians for Safety and Justice, helping to pass multiple state level justice reform bills. Gilbert now leads recidivism reduction re-entry efforts in the city of Los Angeles through the Office of Community Safety. <laughs> Doug Bond is the president and CEO of Amity Foundation. He leads all facets of the organization, bringing his skills as a community builder and visionary leader, seeking continual systemic improvements for marginalized populations. He currently oversees dozens of contracts for Amity Foundation in California and Arizona, including four residential campuses serving over 500 people with histories of criminal justice system involvement, addiction, and homelessness per day. Under his direction, Amity is now developing 300 units of permanent housing and over 200 more beds for residential services. Mr. Bond has been instrumental in expanding Amity's California services, which have increased from serving 2,000 people to over 20,000 people a year in the last five years. He has helped to ensure that people with lived experience have the same opportunities he had, including hiring many employees who have lived experience with the criminal justice system, homelessness, foster care, and other systems involvement. Carmen Garcia is the executive director of Root and Rebound, a nonprofit with a mission to support people navigating reentry and reduce the harms perpetuated by mass incarceration. She was one of the first hires of Root and Rebound, joining in 2014 as a legal assistant and has assumed various roles of increasing responsibility during her time with the organization. Uh, including providing administrative and financial oversight, management and programmatic support. Her expert management of financial resources, HR systems, and operations facilitated the growth of the organization, while her passion and perspectives as a formerly incarcerated individual has guided the development and design of all its programs, resources, and expansions. 
Before coming to Root and Rebound, she worked at City College of San Francisco as a teacher's assistant. She also interned at City College of San Francisco's Second Chance program, which helps previously incarcerated students achieve their full academic potential. She is the proud daughter of migrant farm workers from Texas and currently calls the Bay Area of California home. <laughs> Sam Lewis is the executive director of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Previously, Sam served as director of Inside Programs. A former life prisoner himself, Sam understands the various obstacles, challenges, and difficulties the prison and reentry populations face. Sam previously worked with friends outside Los Angeles County as a job specialist, case manager, employment program supervisor, and project director, roles that reinforced his commitment to creating opportunities for formerly incarcerated men and women as they transition back into society. Currently, Sam serves on LA County's Probation Oversight Committee and the San Quentin, San Quentin Transformation Advisory Council. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Gilbert, over to you. Good, right? Yeah. Opening it up, <laughs> introducing. Uh, thank you, Bianca, for reaching out and coordinating everything along with the amazing team at Zocalo Public Square. Let's give it up for Zocalo Public Square, y'all. And uh, these series wouldn't be made possible without the gracious funding from the James Irvine Foundation. So let's also uh, give a huge round of applause to the James Irvine Foundation. Uh, we have a, a beautiful, beautiful crowd. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah, no, I'm serious. Like, you know, I've been in this work for a long, a long time now, and, and we don't appreciate ourselves enough. We don't celebrate our victories enough, in my experience. And so I'm big on flowers and, and, and giving recognition where recognition is due. I have to give recognition to all of the amazing panelists up here, right? Come on, y'all. Come on, keep the, keep the flowers flowing. Um, I've done some level of work with all of these individuals over the years, and they're in the trenches doing the hard day-to-day -day work, running programs that are changing lives that are reducing crime and violence and preventing and eradicating recidivism. And this is work that is so crucial uh, to our communities, to the movement towards progress. And so I have a, a real deep uh, appreciation for, for everyone up here, you know? And so I also wanna share and just disclaim that I am not here representing the Los Angeles City Mayor's Office, uh, though I love my job. Uh, I love Mayor Bass, uh, Mayor Karen Bass, and her leadership and her ability to get work done. And she's a mover and a shaker, and she's humble, right? She's, she, she loves the people. She loves the community. Um, but I took my mayoral hat and left that off in the car. So uh, I'm here just an everyday uh, community member, you know, community leader. I wanted to uh, uh, ask for some grace because I'm pretty tired. Uh, I have a pregnant wife uh, in her third trimester and five young children, as Bianca mentioned in uh, uh, my uh, you know, introduction. And so bear with me, but we have a great conversation uh, lined up for you all. Today we really wanted to just kind of free flow and have more of a discussion and a dialogue uh, that is solution oriented. Uh, we have to think in solution. We have to think in strategy uh, to continue winning the needs for our communities to continue advancing justice. And there's nobody uh, more fit than these three individuals to uh, bring it regarding the topic of what is a good job for the formerly incarcerated. And so just to jump right in, uh, learn a little bit more about you all. I mean, I know we heard the bios and everything, but to go a little deep, deeper and kind of unpack some of what was shared, I wanted to just ask everybody to uh, share with everyone, uh, how did you come to this work? How did you come to this work? And how did you uh, elevate to the role that you're currently in, positively impacting so many thousands of lives? I mean, we're talking statewide and national work. People are getting free. People are crying after going through your programs. I've seen it. I've witnessed it 
firsthand. And so maybe we could start with you, Doug. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll say uh, I came to this work, the founders of the organization that I now help to lead uh, at Amity Foundation got me out of foster care um, when I was young and reunited with me with my father, uh, with my sister, and then helped my mother when she got out of prison years later. And then the organization actually helped me when I was struggling in my 20s. Um, and could have easily ended up dead or in prison for a very long time. Actually, one of the people that is here in the crowd today, uh, Mark Fawcett, uh, helped mentor me uh, with our founders and others. And it was a group of people that really helped inspire me, changed my life, uh, and taught me how to, to help uh, folks that are coming home to lead this movement as well. So, yeah. so for me, I uh, came into this work it was my first job after um, federal prison. And so when I started working and working at the city college, it was through the work study program. And uh, my mentor there, do the late Dr. Terry Day, uh, he really mentored me and pushed me to support other people. When I left federal prison, the women there said, you know, move forward, don't look back, just keep going forward. And so I thought, okay. But then I was like, you know, there was that internal conflict for me that I just couldn't leave the women behind and not support them and be acting in this world as if I never was in their position, right? And so I felt like I had to do something different. And so luckily he, Dr. Terry Day, came into my life and introduced me and he said, hey, Root and Rebound is hiring a legal administrative assistant. I think you'd be great. And so I connected and I was scared. I have to say I was scared. Uh, my first job, you know, uh, worrying that um, I was not gonna be accepted, that I had the scarlet letter facing, you know, because I was in prison and how was that gonna work out. But luckily, I worked with an amazing team of people who welcomed me. And because of my lived experience, I was able to, you know, just give feedback. At that time, we were just starting our, our reentry guide. It's like a 1,200 page legal guide for California. And so I contributed a lot of, you know, from my personal experience and never really understanding how valuable the lived experience is, right? Because all this time I thought it was something to be ashamed of. Right, and so instead, that was like, wow, other people can actually learn from my mistakes or just the experience and understand that we are worthy of an opportunities. We are worthy. We're human beings, and so, and so that's what kept me going. Just understanding, I started as a legal administrative assistant, and it, I just kept going just because the calls that were coming in. You know, I was the one answering the phones. The first one that I took the first hotline call at Root and Rebound. Hey. And so just, you know, just kept going and just yeah. listening. And for me, it was important that we answered every call because I knew that how it felt to be on the inside on the other end, right? And I knew how I had to behave on this end now because I was out. And so, so yeah, that's how, and that's why I stay in this work because I know how important it is to lift each other up. And sometimes regardless of the difficulties, the barriers. And for me, I think I've been through worse. Like, Whatever I'm experiencing at work, on the outside, you know, leading the organization doesn't compare to what I've lived and to being inside incarcerated with no freedom. So, That's yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on my desk at home sits a Polaroid from uh, 1990. Uh, in solid as visiting room. And I'm sitting with my mom. It's one of the few pictures that I have of her while I was incarcerated with the, both of us together. Uh, I was about three years into a life sentence, and I had been on a yard with so many people that were my age, young, of color. I, I was 20, I was turning 21. Literally on my, my 21st birthday, we sat in the visiting room and I told my mom, this is wrong. I'm wrong, but I don't know how, but I'm gonna change this one day. And my mom looked at me and she said, okay, the first thing you got to do is get your education because I was a high school dropout. Mm -hmm. And she said, when you get your education, then you can figure out how to change this, but get your education first. And so that was 1990. Uh, the 12th of this month made 12 years that I've been home from incarceration after serving 24 years. While inside, yep. thank you. while inside, I met so many incredible people from so many different walks of life that had made bad choices, but they weren't bad people. Mm -hmm. 
And I knew and I promised, and some sit in the audience, some are here, this, that when I go home, I'm gonna figure out how to help us. Lifers were not going home when I went into the system. We weren't going home. I was one of the first that had an opportunity to go home and I told people I wouldn't forget them. And I, and I didn't, and I continue to do this work. But I wanna like, really give a shout out to people that gave me a path, how did I get into this work? I knew I wanted to be in this work, I didn't know I was gonna get here. And so I had a friend named Carl Jones that works in Pasadena that invited me to the Foothill Development Center uh, to meet a lady named Diane Russell and Sarah Mendoza who still work there. And Sarah Mendoza told me, she said, do you wanna work for the city of Pasadena or I can get you in an organization called Friends Outside? And I said, what does Friends Outside do? Friends outside. And she said, they help people that come home from incarceration to find jobs. I said, that's what I wanna do. She says, not a guarantee. She said, I can get you a guaranteed job with the city of Pasadena right now. I said, I wanna help my people. And she said, you have to interview with Mary Weaver. And Mary Weaver, who's still executive director of Friends Outside, gave me an opportunity. And that's why I started cutting my teeth on becoming a case manager, a job specialist, uh, all of the different things that I needed to learn to get to where I'm at. And then I met this really amazing guy that I think sometimes is just like uh, crazy because he has this vision, Scott Budnick. And I told Scott, I want to help people that were inside. I don't want to just do the work in the community. I want to go back inside juvenile halls and prisons so that people can have hope and believe that they can do it. And he said, okay. And I said, but Scott, I have a murder conviction. They won't let me in. And he was like, they'll let you in. You just have to know the right people. And that began the first steps. And so those people helped me begin to meet the right people. And I learned from all of them, every single one of them. So I, I really want to shout them out because without them, 12 years ago, uh, I didn't know how I was going to get into this, this work. And now being able to help thousands of people through laws, through housing, through employment, through all these different things, uh, I've been able to help. I'm not the one, I'm one of the many in this army of reform that's really transforming a system that's helping make it more compassionate with accountability, but with respect and the opportunity to live your best life. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So I can definitely identify with something I heard from each story and really appreciate y'all uh, addressing that, that question. And Carmen, I would like to direct the uh, question directly to you uh, related to the mainstream media and how historical systems have perpetuated narratives on our communities, uh, uh, narratives that are targeted towards formerly incarcerated people or people with records, as I call them. Um, and what is some necessary advice that you would give people uh, working in the employment space, uh, doing workforce development and working in business sectors and industry leaders? Like, what would you tell them as advice regarding a good job for formerly incarcerated folks? Thank you. So the other day I was browsing our info account and I came across um, a Canva, like something that John Rodriguez, one of my colleagues, was working on, and it has to do with uh, language, right? How we talk about how, how we talk about for, formerly incarcerated people, and this is an open letter, I think, by Eddie Ellis, and so it just caught my attention because it stresses of how you know how important it is when you um, when you define someone and you box them in just that place of like convict, uh, inmate, right. criminal, right? It's really hard and it's really challenging for the person in that situation to move forward and to look for a job. If they're described as that to an employer, right, to just even friends or people, right, that they're formerly incarcerated and then the fear starts and then we start creating our own narrative about who that person is as opposed to what they could be, right? That was a mistake and uh, one of my other mentors, Jason Bell, he always, he says, you know, you don't want to be remembered for your worst mistake. Like, how is that possible that that's what sticks, right? right? And so fortunately, that's how it is. So part of what we do and what we're pushing for at Root and Rebound is that narrative change because we're trying to get more stakeholders, bring stakeholders to the table, more employers, right, to hire more formerly incarcerated people. But it has to start with changing how we see 
each other, how we see them, right? How we see us, how people see me, you know, that's super important. And so taking that first step. And so I, I feel like the language, it starts with the language and John is right on point there that it starts with the language, right? And how the, the words that we use to define each other. And so, and, and that makes it easier because I feel like not just not just for the person, right? But also for like the, uh, when they're looking for jobs or housing or even going to school. Like it's important that they're not defined by their worst mistake every day of their lives, right? And so, and so I think that um, starting with the language, starting with the story we tell about people. And, you know, I, I'm very much of like, if somebody wants to share their story with you, they share it with you. But if they don't, they don't. And it shouldn't be on each of us to be judgmental about, you know, them. It's like who they are right now. And I know there's been several studies done. I know Stanford did one a few years ago about how formerly incarcerated people are like, work twice, three times harder than people without criminal records, right? And I know for me, I even though the job when I started, I was getting paid $14 an hour. I was like, hey, that's more than the five cents I was earning when I was in prison, five cents an hour, right? So that was a big jump. Although given, you know, now that I was out, I had, you know, rent, I had, you know, a daughter to take care of. So it was, it was not that much, but at the same time, it was more rewarding for me to be in that community knowing that I wasn't someone that could give back financially, but I knew that in my in my in the work that I was doing, it was given back in ways that 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 would benefit the person just based on my experience, and just just trying to change, treat them like human beings. So then they, you know, then they also feel valued and appreciated and invested in just by simply how we talk about people with criminal records. Absolutely, our work is is deeply about humanizing people. Uh, the people first language, the people first approach, the care first community approach uh, that the, the county has, has led for the last several years. And so many community leaders uh, that have been a part of that work through the alternatives to incarceration, through uh, justice not jails. I mean, we've been grinding and by providing people uh, the, the vehicle to lead work that we thought we'd never be doing you know, um, that's how we are experiencing so much change. And so we all have dignity and value, and I thank you for uplifting that. Um, Doug, I wanted to speak to uh, also a historical aspect around how formerly incarcerated people have been locked out of entire job markets and sectors due to uh, the systemic barriers that are imposed, or legal restrictions, legal sanctions, that are imposed for no other reason than to further punish and further victimize an individual, sometimes well after they've done their time, they've gotten off paperwork, they haven't committed any crimes, yet we still face uh, so many barriers. And through all of that, we've seen some very significant advancements in the criminal justice reform movement, or what I call uh, just the last 10, 15 years, the decade, of criminal justice reform. We had AB 109 passed. We had Proposition 47, Proposition 57, Prop 17. I mean, we've been grinding, right? And so what I wanted to ask is, can you explain some of those victories, specifically uh, fair chance hiring? Can you explain and break down what fair chance hiring means and what that looks like for us as individuals with records? Can you speak to ban the box a little bit and also uh, share some insight about uh, the current growth sectors that formerly incarcerated folks, justice impacted folks should be looking into. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I think there's been a lot of victories. I, I think some of the historically, and there still are tens, you know, thousands and thousands, uh, actually 24,000 or more uh, restrictions uh, for folks that are coming home or barriers. Um, and that's state by state, county by county, city by city, and federally, federally throughout the U.S. And so there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I will say there's been a lot of victories, ban the box being one, and fair chance hiring practices where people don't have to disclose uh, criminal history and, and incarceration uh, charges on their application process. Uh, so people with five or more employees 
don't have to look at that. So they're screening people in, not out. And so a lot of practices have been set up to screen people out rather than include people. I would say a lot of the victories that have taken place actually started with a lot of the community-based orgs. Um, a decade or more ago, a lot of uh, contracts and services for folks that were coming out of incarceration actually couldn't hire individuals that are formerly incarcerated. And so many community-based orgs were stuck with restrictions where to go back and work in a prison, you had to be off parole for three or five years. Um, and it was discouraging people that actually could be the most qualified to work in that workforce. Um, and through leadership and through change, there's incredible changes. Now we have many groups here, many other community-based orgs uh, are hiring individuals that are actively on parole, going back into prisons, going into jails, helping to lead these efforts in the community. So it really had to start with us. Um, because if we don't have the hiring practice that we're hiring individuals that we're working with, our students, I'll say students, because that's what we call uh, our participants at Amity, um, we won't accept a contract. We'll change the law, we'll change policy, we'll change whatever we have to to allow that, but that's not an acceptable practice for us because it doesn't represent who we serve. Um, so community-based orgs have to be the first, I think, group to do that. Uh, so there's been a lot of victories, I would say, in that space. Um, and many other spaces. There's a lot of folks here uh, that are doing a lot of the policy work that allows us to change the laws that open up those doors for more employment opportunities. Uh, we talk about gross sector industries. Healthcare is a huge gross sector industry and has huge workforce shortages. And so we have to reduce those barriers. We have to get people into uh, good paying jobs. Family sustainable wages, I would say, not just livable wages, because the livable wages can just be an individual but not support an entire family. And so how do we support family sustainable wages for people? Uh, and frankly, the job opportunities for people that are coming home from incarceration should be the same job opportunities that anybody in the community is afforded to. Uh, and we need to provide education with stipends and so people aren't working and trying to go to school full time. And so I think there's a lot of things that can be done um, to get into technology, to get into Hollywood industries, to get into construction trades, to get into many of these industries that are really struggling right now. And you know, we're, we've grown from a, an organization that had 100 employees uh, when I started with to having over 1,000. And we've had to build that workforce with people that are coming home. And anything that we hire for, we want it to be represented by those we serve. So I think there's a lot of wins. Uh, out there. I think there's still a lot of challenges. We still have to reduce a lot of barriers. And we have to be careful that we're not restricting people um, and reducing those opportunities for people coming home. So I think that we really need to look at, for the national, our, our nation works with the, what's called the Council on Competitiveness. Uh, and I'll say as my father ended up going to prison and couldn't read or write, they didn't really have education programs. I remember that being a child growing up but my aunt went to Stanford, George Washington, and MIT, and ended up doing a whole bunch of things. And she ended up working with a group called the Council on Competitiveness. And so as a country, we look at what are the gross sector industries for people? How are we informing educational schools? And how are we informing universities? Um, how are we looking at what the future, what the next five years, or what the next 10 years beyond that is going to look like for us? And we have to think in that aspect. We have to be part of those conversations. We really need to be looking at. What are the green jobs that are coming online? What is the infrastructure opportunities that are coming online that we need to be a part of? And we need to be part of that process and part of that discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned something that really stood out. Uh, everything was profound, of course, but community organizations standing as the first line of defense for people coming home. Um, it was community coalition, which was mentioned earlier, that really helped end my life of crime and criminal activity activity because they did not hold my long criminal record against me, similar to what you were sharing earlier, Carmen. And just thinking numbers nationally, there's 70 to 80 million people with a felony, with a uh, record, right? And there's 48,000 legal restrictions nationally that are preventing folks from moving forward. And so our policy change work is critical to the movement and getting folks free. And so Sam, I know you've had a, a huge role in a lot of that movement building work. And, uh, you know, as my fellow South Centralian, 
as I call us, uh, you know, growing up um, in the trenches of South Central in the 80s and the 90s, it, it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, it was a lot to navigate. Uh, when you think about uh, generational poverty being as common as a cold, common cold, when you think about the laws that were intentionally designed to lock certain communities out of opportunities for advancement, unstable housing, poor quality housing, poor educational uh, opportunities, right? There was a lot that uh, we, we had to deal with and had to face and overcome. And uh, my question for you, or what are your thoughts about the intersections of some of those social and economic conditions that were pretty much imposed on our communities and uh, the role that poverty has played in crime and violence? Great question, Gilbert. But first, I want to touch on a couple of key points. Uh, I don't want any of my people to come home and get a job. I want them to have careers. I want them to be able to be entrepreneurs, run million dollar corporations. Yeah. If you have the skill set, you should be able to do that. And if right. you don't have the skill set, organization like Underground Scholars and others, and, and the, the, if I don't name you, you're out there, help us get those skill sets so that we can have the careers that any other person uh, that's never been incarcerated has. So I don't want you to have a job. My teenage kids can have a job so they can have extra spending money while they're in high school, but I want people that are coming home to have careers so they can truly stand on their own two feet and not have to worry about anything but getting up demonstrating that they're the best at what they do and coming home every night and taking care of their, their families. That's one. Two, you touched on policy and, and, and these barriers, uh, uh, 24,000. Um, for those lifers that are sitting out there, if you see me on social media, if you heard about it, Senate Bill 731, we talk about the clean, clean slate acts across the United States, California is leading the way. My conviction was for murder and three attempted murders. And I have my record expunged November 9th. Woo! <laughs> California is the only state that will allow right now for a person that has paid their debt to society, that has demonstrated that, that they're contributing to, to the gains of our society, the opportunity to put their, their, their past behind them. Time done, it's over, let me move forward. And so, if you're afraid, I'll stand with you at your expungement. If you don't know how, reach out to us in conjunction with many other community-based organizations to set your expunging process up so you can have some of those careers that have barriers that, that you need to get past. But please don't feel like you can't do it. If I can do it, I know you can do it. I'm not unique, I'm not a unicorn. Please take advantage of this law that we worked together to pass that tops every, that, that leads the nation when we talk about the Clean Slate Acts in all 50 states, California's number one. Let's implement that, that let's make it happen. Uh, Gilbert, you, uh, you touched on, you asked about the question, generational wealth, um, generational poverty. Mm. If you go back to the First World War, GIs came home from that, that World War and you had the GI Bill, we still have that bill, mm -hmm. and you could go buy a home without a down payment the middle class began to get built. This was 1919, like, you started being able to build that. You were able to go to school for free. Then we had the Second World War, and I hate the fact that we still have wars. We have two that are going on right now. I hate the fact, but some of the things that came out of the, those two world wars, we had the, the GI Bill, uh, more GIs came home. But the people that were locked out of those opportunities were people of color. So you couldn't build generational wealth. If you think about it, a GI that's coming home, uh, he or she, or they have the opportunity to purchase a home without uh, a down payment. They pay that home off, they give it to their kids, they pass away, their kids build on that wealth. Mm -hmm. And that wealth b continues to grow. How is it level if every group is not able to access that? And so if we go back, those, those are things that started, that, that are part of the systemic uh, uh, poverty uh, that plague us in places like South LA that lives at or below the poverty line. Uh, uh, 40 million, about 40 million Americans live at or below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. Why? The richest country in the world and we can't solve this? We can. We just need the political will 
and the, the, the know-how, and we have them. We, have, we, we might not have a will, but that's up to us, and that's where your vote comes in at. If we think about, if you really get into the history of redlining, mm -hmm. uh, just, just not even five years ago, one of the big banks was charged with charging uh, African Americans high, higher interest rates for loans. This is how you create systemic poverty, and poverty drives incarceration. Poverty drives crime. I'm not making excuses for anyone. I want you to just think of it this way. Uh, not too long ago on the news, like we, we're looking at all these retail thefts. There was a lady that got arrested for stealing baby formula. Do you think she was stealing that to sell it? Why does someone have to steal something to feed their child in the richest nation in the world? We should have paid training programs for people to go into careers, not jobs, careers, so that they can stand on their own two feet. And the zero sum belief that if I give a dollar by uh, uh, making sure through my tax dollars people can, can have trade pay, uh, trade pay training, that's not true. Think of it this way, if this table, if these, these are very wealthy people in these two bottles, and the table are the people that live at uh, uh, the poverty line or below. If I lift this table up, what happens to the bottles? They lift up too, right? Right? So why can't we do this for every single person that lives in this country, help them get to where, they're at, where, where they need to be? It would decrease our, our, our incarceration rate. It will increase our tax revenues. It will make our schools better. It will make our communities better. All we need is the political will to be able to do this. And can you imagine how we would transform not just our communities, but this entire country, just with the desire to give the least of us an opportunity to be able to live our best life? Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, far too often decision makers um, in our society in its entirety overlook uh, the drivers of crime and violence. You know, an individual wasn't just born, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to grow up and be a murderer. Nobody wanted to, to do that growing up, but there are circumstances, and once you get to the root causes, of what built this tree, then you can begin to unpack trauma. Then you can begin to deal with mental health and address the issues. And so um, I wanted to pivot a little bit from my next question and ask uh, and open it up to everybody uh, just to see what are some of the most important factors or essentials that you must have prior to release and upon release when coming home to be successful, to have economic uh, mobility and, and stability, and to be entrepreneurs and business owners, like you mentioned. Like, what are some of the, the essential just must-haves that folks uh, need for a sex, successful reintegration and reentry into society? Uh, I would say, and, and we're doing it in California, it's one, education. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have college programs on every single yard. Uh, you have some uh, master's programs and bachelor's programs. We need more uh, trades. But I think one of the most, two of, two of the most important things that we, we need to do more of is one, we need mentors like Doug talked about, Carmen talked about. We need, when, we, when I was one of the first lifers to go back inside, and people didn't believe I was a lifer, a former life prisoner, mm. to see that it's possible, to make sure that people can see that there's a better life for you out there, but you have to plug into the resources. And the resources we have to pour into these facilities. Because if you think about it, it costs $90,000 a year to keep a person locked up, and that person is, is released. And now that person work, makes $160,000. Add those two figures up, that's your rate of return on investment. And the intangible is then enhanced public safety and how you actually influence younger people. Because they begin to see you come home in your hard hat or in your suit. And they say, I want to do what you do. What do you do for a living? I want to do what you do. Like, what do you do? You get to build houses. I want to build houses like you. They have to see it. They have to imagine it. But in order to do that, we have to pour those resources in, in, into our facilities, education, trades. And the two things that we must not forget about are mentors or life coaches that will guide that popu our population to plug it into those resources. And the last thing I'll say is this, and, and we're running a bill on this uh, this year, therapy to yeah. heal the trauma that we've experienced, whether it's ACEs or trauma that we've experienced prior to incarceration, while incarceration, so that we, when we come home, we are close to being, if not our best self, and able to step into those careers to be able to take care of our families. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was, I was also going to say therapy, and which is why I went to school and d took psychology classes. But most importantly, it was because when I was in jail before going to prison, I was part of the Choices program. Mm. And so this program is modeled after Delancey Street, the Delancey Street program. And so it, it was there for the first time that I actually had a, a counselor actually talk to me, right? And so I was at this point, I was 40 years old, and that was the very first time that anyone talked about the trauma that happened to me, you know? And so for my whole life, like, you know, um, let me give you an example. So when I was five years old, I was sexually molested. I was five years old, mm -hmm. right? And to carry that for so many years and nobody ever talking to you about it, but then the place that you find that therapy and that support that you need was behind bars. And I often say that I was in my own prison long before I went to prison, you know, because of so many things that happened in my life, but never had the support or even the guidance, right? Given the community that I was from, right? It was just never there, it was never offered. And I'm sure I wasn't the only one, you know? People like me just never had that. But I, I was, you know, lucky enough that I came to the jail where they had this choices program. And that helped me so much, just, just kind of releasing me from my past and forgiving, forgiving myself. And then also letting go of stuff that I wasn't responsible for. What could I have been responsible for at the age of five? You know, or losing a, a child. Like, how was that my fault? But we, you know, we just, I just, you know, just took that in and, and that, that was more trauma, more, more things that I was not coping with and didn't know how to. I didn't have the tools. And so that's why it's very important, Sam, exactly, the therapy. So when people come out, they're prepared, not just for the just coming out after so many years of incarceration and, and a whole new life out there, but just the ups and downs mm. of coming out, the disappointments, you know? Like, I didn't even have a, an ID when I got out and having to go place to place just to get a voucher to pay for an ID. I didn't even have $2 to get on the bus to go, you know, to go all those things. So just trying to navigate life afterwards, it was really, really disappointing, but I knew, I knew, I, it was through a different lens that I was seeing life. It was no longer like, oh, I'm a victim, or this happened to me. It was like, yes, I refuse to be a victim. And I'm going to do whatever I have to do, right, to make sure that I go past this, no matter what I have to do, and no matter where I have to start from. But I'm not going to stop there. You know, that's what led me to sign up for uh, college, even though it was against my case manager's uh, request and support. They were like, no, you have a criminal record. You have to take whatever job is offered. Yeah. Going to college is a waste of time. You know, and had I believed them, I would not be here today, you know, because I would have taken a, uh, it was a telemarketing job, second shift in Oakland, paying minimum wage, mm. you know? And so, so it's just like, no, but, but you have to be prepared mentally before you're able to make those tough decisions. And even now, you know, as an executive director, making those tough decisions, but I always like lean back on my experiences and the support that I got you know, before, and then lean on people that have been there, done that, and, you know, mentors like Sam Lewis, you know, people that are just amazing people that have, you know, uh, supported me and continue to support me throughout this, this, you know, this journey now for me. But yes, you know, that, that mental support therapy is super important. Uh, are, are there any additional tools that you think are helpful um, pre-release and post-release? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Sam and I just uh, f finished some of the recommendations for the advisory council with a group of people uh, for San Quentin. And I think we talk a lot about how do we transform the system both inside to be rehabilitative and healing and the re-entry to both be uh, healing as well. Um, and that has to take place with the workforce as well as those that are incarcerated. Um, because frankly, if, if that, the whole system is not set up to be rehabilitative and supportive and therapeutic, um, then we're not gonna bring people home safely. And so we have to, a lot of work that we have to do on that end, I think um, working and breaking down that we-they dynamic with mm -hmm. corrections and they're part of 
what we need to do to support people coming home and they have to be working on their retraining. I was just hearing a, an individual that, a corrections leader talking about courts are punitive and uh, corrections needs to be rehabilitative, which is a total mindset change. Um, and it's incredible to see some of this shift, but we also gotta bring people home safely. We have to have healing communities. Um, you know, we have community reentry projects that allow people to come home 30 months early and end up spending the last two years of their incarceration in a community-based setting, getting work, getting health care, getting all the resources that all of us are afforded in the community. And then beyond that, I would just say, you know, there's not enough focus on housing. Mm -hmm. We haven't really brought that into this conversation. That really needs to be an important part of workforce as well too. If people can't get into affordable housing or there are barriers on, we talk about ownership, you know, but we have to make sure that people can get into affordable housing as well. Um, and we create those pathways that we make sure that there's workforce housing opportunities for individuals. And so it's a sequencing and coordination, getting people access to healthcare. Um, frankly, mental health is part of that. Primary care is another big part of that as well, too. So it's just really making sure that everything's coordinated um, between a lot of organizations that all have an incredible mindset of change um, if we're going to really end mass incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think about the work uh, that I'm leading in the mayor's office, and we're definitely not getting rich off of it, but I can remember back when I was broke as a joke. I mean, I was so broke, I couldn't pay attention. <laughs> and I didn't know anything <laughs> about financial literacy and financial wellness. So that's another point that I wanted to bring up, the importance of being able to save, the importance of being able to build credit, the importance of understanding how to build a financial roadmap towards economic stability and success is also a key component. So I just wanted to make sure we uplifted the importance of financial literacy as well. I also really want for everybody that's in the audience, if you know funders, if you know governmental agencies, like this is something that we haven't thought about, retirement. Mm -hmm. I came, I went in when I was 18, I came home when I was 42. I just looked up on social security, how much would I receive if I retired at 65? If I retired at 70, I wouldn't retire. I'd get about $2,300 a month if I retired at 65. If I retire at 70, I get maybe $700 more than that. Uh, I have a 401k, doesn't have a lot in it. I would burn through that almost immediately. Uh, working, if you think about it, I've been working for 12 years. Hmm. My formative t years were spent inside prison. How do we fix that? Because what we're going to create is a permanent underclass or a group of people, when they get to 75, 80, like, like my mom is 85, she just turned 85, she owns her own home, she's retired, she's good. She, she's struggling with some other things, but we have to think about our population that's inside. How do we set it up so that maybe one day can we create a way for people to retire? Because like, if I look at it like just honestly, uh, being transparent, I can't, I can't retire. There, there's no way that I can retire even though I make a, 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 a good salary, I have some money in a 401k and with social security, like I, I wouldn't be able to. Like I, I couldn't live in the city of LA. I don't think I could live in a county LA. I, like I could find somewhere maybe, but uh, it would be subsidized housing or something to that effect uh, because uh, I'm 54 now. Do the math. I came, went in, came home at 42, been home 12 years, I'm 54 now. Another nine years, I'll be 65 it's not going to add up. Like I would have to be putting, putting away in my 401k something like you know, $300,000. Like go do the, I did the math. I had a financial advisor and like, you really want the truth? You're going to probably continue to work for the rest of your life. Mm. And so what happens, and I came home at 42, good shape, like sound mind, educated. What about the person that comes home at 65? Mm. Like when we think, so, so I just want to touch on, on that, and, I want, and, and when I'm saying that, I want you to think about this, and, 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 and there's, there's studies out. Long sentences do not change people. Rehabilitative programming changes people. Yeah. Mentors and life coaches to help them plug into those changes people so you don't have to get out when you're 42 or 54 or 65 uh, 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 and, and not being able to like really one day have maybe five years, three years of retirement. 
uh, to enjoy your twilight years before you, that, like, it's, it's time to go home to the Lord. So just want, want you to think in terms of uh, the 94,000 people that are currently incarcerated in California, but also the thousands that have come home that are trying to figure these things out. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Give it up, give it up. And so uh, we're, we're approaching Q&A, so we're gonna do a speed round, but I wanted to make sure that we closed out uh, with demands. You know, in community organizing, we're taught that power can seize nothing without a demand, right? And I just wanted you to quickly rapid fire, uh, machine gun, share with the crowd and with our virtual audience, shout out to our folks joining us virtually, uh, just share what demands, what bold demands would you give to the powers that be who have the ability to hire us, to have, that have the wherewithal and the, the access to be able to hire us and pull us into some of these growth sector industries and see us as a human. So what, what, what demands would you give to some of the, the key players? I would just say like invest like in organizations like ours that we can, so that we're able to uh, support the people coming out, you know, prison and jails in ways that will help them, like, you know, get housing, uh, you know, employment and be in a better position to accumulate wealth, right? And through that is the removing some of those legal barriers through uh, expungements, record cleaning, you know, that luckily for us, we have, you know, amazing, uh, um, amazing uh, partners the anti resident Coalition and, mm -hmm. and also amazing funders that support our work, like the James Irvine Foundation, yeah. you know, the Cal Wellness. So just invest in people, invest, show us that we matter, that we're important, and that we're worthy of this opportunity as well. I say. My demand would be connect with big companies like NBC Universal that hires people in these careers. NBC Universal has internships for people that are formerly incarcerated, mm -hmm. puts them in careers. NBC Universal is the real deal. Uh, connect with, with, with like companies like that that are saying, you know what? We know how to work with people that have been incarcerated. And I say NBC Universal because they know, like we've helped work with their HR staff to figure out the background checks, what's necessary. So if you connect with something like NBC Universal, JP Morgan and Chase, these big companies, they give you an opportunity at a career. If you're a big company and you're not sure, and, and uh, I might get in trouble for this, but like ABC, yeah. CBS, reach out to NBC. They know what they're doing. Like, re really, for real. Step up. Step up to the plate. Hey, it's demand time. Yeah, um, you know, I'll say I've worked with a lot of different states. I'd say to uh, Sam's point and uh, our panelist's point on this is that California is leading the way. Uh, in many ways, a lot of states are coming here, red or blue, uh, to look at our models here, but we need to continue to push. I'd say paid trainings. We need to do more paid trainings. If we had the urgency that we had during the pandemic to help everyone that was coming home, we'd be in a far better place. We brought 15,000 additional people home during that time. The most. And the most. Yeah. And we had a sense of urgency, uh, paid stipends support for housing, expansion of resources in the community, do whatever it takes to get it done to bring people home, we'd be in a far better place. And when I said the most, partnerships. <laughs> when I said the most, because we worked together on this, Doug was here, the most in the United States, we brought the most people home, put them in jobs, put them in housing of any other state in the United States. Yeah. That's right. And I would say that that was done with public-private partnerships. Government's not gonna fix it all. And so we really need to leverage public-private partnerships to maximize impact in our community. Give it up, y'all, come on. Did y'all learn anything? I know I learned. Right hand is down. Okay, we're ready for Q&A. If you have a question, please come line up right here beside me. And I'm gonna start with an in-person question because you guys got here real quick. <laughs> All right. So please uh, just say your name and then come up here to this pink mark here and keep your question brief, please. I can't see. Thank you so much. My name is Martha Yanis, uh, formerly incarcerated as well. Um, my uh, question is, um, has anybody ever looked into changing maybe having formerly incarcerated to be added into, um, say, 
part of the umbrella like like of prejudice i guess like the five uh, you know like you know what i'm saying like like part of the umbrella like lbtbg uh, you know uh, people with disabilities things like that but well, people formerly incarcerated as well because we do ha there is a stigma out there and we do get treated different and there is a prejudice big prejudice out there we need to execute that EOC. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to look at it like that. We have to address the fact that we can't discriminate against anyone. And that means individuals that are formerly incarcerated. That means folks that are marginalized and disenfranchised in our community. And so it really needs to be led by community-based orgs, you know, in terms of what, uh, how we're treating people and the community as a whole in terms of how we're treating people. Frankly, I think a lot of our work has to be a people-centered approach. And so we can't, um, we had language is a big part. We talked about that earlier. I think there's many facets to that. And then we have to d dive into the policy on things and identify when there are those barriers to help change that. We're constantly talking about, okay, this is going on. We need to fix it. We're just talking about there, about the expungement for more lifers coming home because they're not aware of it right, right. Uh, in the community. So I think we need to do that collectively and as a whole. Uh, I'd, I'd add to that two things. So, so I know county and city jobs, uh, along with ban when, when you look at ban the box, yep. uh, your conviction cannot even be considered or talked about until after the job has been made. And then there has to be a nexus if they're going to deny you. Right. But put more teeth into that. And then breaking down the barriers, like Doug said, we did this with our firefighting program. Mm -hmm. uh, we started a firefighting program that allows people that have been incarcerated to become firefighters. But we, we learned with Cal Wildland firefighting is, if you don't have an EMT license, you can only be a Cal Wildland firefighter. You can't be a city or a county firefighter. In order to do that, you have to get your record expunged. So we ran a bill to help get the firefighters' records expunged. And now firefighters that are coming home from incarceration, once they complete the training, they can be a firefighter, whether it's in the city, the state, or the federal government, because we, we ran that bill. So definitely, those are the, the, the shift in, in, in the work on polish is something that we yeah. can't stop. We have, to, we have to push forward on that. And part of this goes back to the understanding, like our elected officials champion those causes and we have to champion our elected officials when we're making sure that they stay in office to change those things. You know, just say vote. You know, we have a lot of folks that come home now that have the rights to vote now. And so we need to, we need to speak with our votes as well. Yep. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to the next question here. Thank you. My name is Lynn. I work for Amity within the prison system. And uh, in trying to help uh, the people we work with, uh, it is sometimes difficult to be able to fully help them because we don't have all the information uh, working with them. But how can we make this information, what I'm hearing tonight, available to them? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll answer that. I think, you know, part of what we talked about at St. Quentin is getting that information and coordination and sequencing, um, getting access to more. One thing I'll say is that people have a lot of work experience that's done in prison that's not transform translated over to the community. And so how do we take all the work experience that's happening while folks are incarcerated and making sure that that information is actually getting in the community? I've seen assessments where people are electricians, frankly, and helping to maintain the prisons. And then they come home, and that's not translated over to work experience. And so we have to do a better job of coordinating on those experiences as well, making sure that different systems, I, Substance abuse has to coordinate with employment services, has to coordinate with mental health and health care and all the above. If, if I'm clear and, and I understand, it's like making sure the population is informed. So if this is filmed by uh, Arizona yeah. uh, State, here, here's a great idea. Uh, CDCR will actually yeah. let you uh, send in this video. You just will have to break it down into segments of 55 minutes. And then it can be shown in the, on their closed circuit TV inside the institution for every single person that's incarcerated to be able to get this information. All you have to do is send it to them, they'll review it, they'll see that there's nothing harmful in it, and guess what? Everybody inside gets a chance to see it and then start realizing these are things that are available for them and, and, and learn how to plug in to those resources. And for those that are going into the institution, I see yeah. some of you out there, 
Yeah. Share the information. Like we just have to make sure that we continuously put information out there for people to understand that there's an opportunity in a life for you out here. And we can also create like a one pager to send in with all the resources we send to people that are inside. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Hi, uh, Mr. Mallory, uh, formerly incarcerated in Missouri, uh, moved out of California. Um, so how would you, like what advice would you give on breaking the defeatist mindset of, uh, of uh, re people re-entering society? I would, uh, others can answer. I would say that folks that are coming home are leading these efforts. And so, you know, this is not, um, folks aren't just getting token career opportunities coming home, is it? In terms of the Vedas mindset, folks are leading these efforts. We're leading these, you know, um, organizations and communities. You have it needs to be the standard for these organizations to be led by individuals that have lived experience, not the exception. Right. right. I would say I was in uh, Lancaster Prison last year on Level Four Yard, and I told it was a group of about 50 to 60 um, brothers that. There are people who care about you. There are people like myself that genuinely want to see you do well, that genuinely want to see you be successful. And so if you see somebody struggling because of their record or struggling with this mindset of can't, uh, then help them out. You know, it's not always about giving somebody uh, a hand out, but a hand up, pull them up. We're all in this together. We have to lock arms and really build a community of support where people understand that they are valued, that they are a human, and that they are loved. And so I would say that that community of support is really important to defeat that can't, I can't mindset that many systems have imposed on our communities. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Owens, and um, I've been mentoring a young man who's serving a life sentence in Colorado. And uh, he and a team and his team have been uh, designing and implementing an anti-recidivism program at, at Sterling Prison that prepares people months ahead of time before their release. I wanted to find out if there's any collaboration between different departments of corrections across the country to share best practices, programs, things that are working, data um, to help reduce recidivism and really prepare people for life on the outside. So I'll say yes, there are. Uh, I've been in those discussions. Actually, uh, the founder of ARC that Sam spoke about, Scott Budnick, just presented to uh, all 50 directors of correction about the work that Anti-Recidivism Coalition does and other community-based orgs. So there is a lot of discussion. I think all states um, are trying to figure out what works. And we've had Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, many other states coming over here to look at what's going on in California. Um, and you know, I, I would also mention, Sam's very humble in this too, is that lifers have helped lead this movement, yeah. frankly, from the inside. Because when we talk about hope, those lifers have, that are inside have changed their lives and gone through the rehabilitation process and worked for redemption without any hope of coming home. When Sam talked about lifers weren't coming home, uh, I was just in Tehachapi with a, a gentleman that this was transitioned down from death row. And he is now getting trained as a substance abuse counselor uh, on a level four yard in a prison and to help individuals that are struggling after those circumstances takes a lot of other people's excuses away, quite frankly. And so I just want to give credit where credit's due. A lot of this effort in the late 80s was actually built on a committed group of lifers and carried on by individuals that had no hope of coming home. OK, this is the last question we have time for. However, everyone who's in line, you'll get an opportunity to speak with the panelists during the reception. So you will have an opportunity to have your questions answered. Hi, my name is Mitchell Bennett. And 16 years ago, I served uh, four years at 18 to 22 in Ohio. And um, I moved to California because they only go back 10 years on background checks. California's been good to me. But my question is, how is being the largest population of prisoners in the world going to allow us to compete on a global scale? Could you rephrase the you question? Say, I didn't hear the last uh, part. Yeah, could. Uh, so my, my question is, 
How is being the largest population of prisoners in the world going to allow us to compete on a global scale? Sustainability is not only about tangibles, but human beings' lives as well. So for, first, I'd like to say, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but in the past 12, 13 years, we've cut California's prison population in half. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, not, not me, oh, everybody. Everybody. California had at one yeah. point 178,000 people in prison. That's right. Yeah. We're at about 93,000, 94,000 right now. And the first time in 50 years we closed prisons. Their prisons closed to, set to close this year. Yeah. Right. Like, That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so if we practice this model that's being created by community-based yeah. organizations with philanthropy, government support, private sector support yeah. of people being able to come home, get careers, we, we pour in resources on the inside, we decrease the number of people that are inside prisons. The goal is uh, to end mass incarceration and put people in position right. to have careers, to be the best version of themselves and to give back to their communities. We're doing that. And if, if people don't believe you're doing that, stop and think about it. 178,000, 93,000. Yep. We have a method of doing this. Again, we have to stick with having the political will yeah. and people have to, like uh, Gilbert said, grind, grind, but also give people inside the hope that we can do this. And, and part of that hope is for those business leaders that, that are out there, think about it this way. Uh, and, and it was mentioned on the panel earlier. Uh, you'll find, I know, even at this position, when I first started working, no one ever beat me to work. Mm -hmm. When I first started, no one beat me to work. I remember my supervisor would come and be like, you, don't, you know you don't have to come this early. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I'm reading my book. When it's time to go in, I'm going in. Now, sometimes people beat me to work. Not because, <laughs> not, not because I'm not getting up as early, but I got a four-year-old grandson that needs a little bit of help along the way. But my point is, people that have been in the system will work harder because they want their second chance to demonstrate that one, we can do this, and if you give us the opportunity, not only will I be your best employee, I'll be number one. Mm. And you say, I want 10 more, 20 more like that one. Whether it's him, her, them, they, we demonstrate, we show up. And so given the opportunity, uh, we'll continue to change the way this looks. We just have to not stop, we're halfway there. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to, to my people in philanthropy, we're almost there. Please don't stop. We have a model where we can completely change this social ill. Please do not stop when we're halfway to the finish line. Yeah. How about that, folks? <laughs> yeah, come on. Give it to us. Just, just want to uh, thank you all. You know, so, so much gratitude. You know, gratitude is medicine in this work. We don't give it out enough, and, and I'm thankful. I learned a lot. I'm sure the crowd and our folks uh, online learned a lot. Uh, really appreciate you all sharing your insights, your wisdom, your knowledge, your lived experience, the whole nine. And, and want to give another big shout out to uh, Zocalo. So the Zocalo Public Square for uh, creating this space right, for um, holding space for folks that were once deemed hopeless, holding space for people that come from marginalized communities and, and giving us a platform to really speak truth to power. I hope folks in positions of power take notes, take heed to what we're telling you because we've lived it and seen it and done it. We know what works. We're leading work that works and that work needs to be funded more. And so I'm with you on the the call to action for philanthropy. And so thank you to our, our leaders that um, don't buckle, you know, that, that poke your chest out in times of uncertainty. Um, you have support, you have a backing, you have community leaders like us right here that will stand by you and stand with you. And so another major shout out to uh, the James Irvine Foundation again uh, for your support and just the great work. Uh, that, that you all are leading across the state and supporting programming such as this across the nation. Uh, I wanna say right now, we're gonna actually 
transition into a reception, want to uh, show love to the folks that didn't get to answer your question. So we'll be here. We're not going anywhere. We're going to stick around. We definitely want to engage with you. We are all about community, building community, engaging with our community. Those are values that I hold dearly to, and I know my comrades up here and panelists also do. And so uh, Doug, Carmen, Sam, thank you again for this phenomenal discussion. Thank you all again for being here. Yeah, all of that good stuff. Uh, really appreciate you showing up today and continue to show up. That's all, folks. Thank you. Hey, man, that was, uh, that was good stuff. Wow. Man. Thank yeah. you. Amazing. Yeah.